Hi everyone, my name is Raymond and I will be doing a CS61A midterm 2 walkthrough for spring 2016. So for our first problem, we have box and pointers with linked lists. In the first line, L is going to be referencing to a linked list where the first element of the first link is 1 and the first element of the second link is 2 and I'm going to link them together with this arrow. Next, we have P equals L. So P will reference the object the, that L is referencing to. Next, we have Q equals link of L and link of P. So we're going to create two new links, objects. The first value of the first link is L. So this is the same link here because of this arrow. Now next, the first value of the next link will be P. P is referencing to the same object, so we have an arrow up here. Now third line, P.rest.rest equals Q. So P.rest, so this is P.rest is referencing to this link, dot .rest is this box. Here right now is nil, we're going to change this, and it's going to be referencing to the object that Q is referencing to. So let's move on to problem B. We're going to start off L as an empty linked list, and we're going to iterate over a range of 3. So in 3 iterations, I is going to be equal to 0, 1, and 2. And in each iteration, we're going to create a new link with I as the first value and L as the rest, and then we're going to have L change its reference to this new linked list. So let's start off as making an empty linked list, and L is referencing to this. So here in the first iteration, i equals 0. So we're going to create a new linked list with first value as 0. It's going to have rest be what L is currently pointing at, which is this. And now L's reference will change to this new link. In the second iteration, i is 1. So we create a new linked list with 1. Its rest value is going to be pointing to L. And now L's value gets updated to this to the beginning of this linked list. Finally, we get into our last iteration. i is 2, so we have 2. It's going to reference to what l currently is. And now l is going to finally get reference to the beginning. So let's move on to problem 3. This is a rather complicated question because we have recursive ca calls that are returning tuples. So let's call crack1 of p. p is going to be this linked list. And the L, in this case, is going to be referencing to the beginning of our linked list. And we need to check that if L is linked.empty, which is not. And we're going to make this assignment statement. So we're going to have L1 and L2 here. And these are going to be equal to the result of calling crack1 on L.rest. So L.rest is this link. So we're going to enter a new frame here. And again, we're going to have L1 and L2 here which is going to be the result uh, assigned to the return value of the recursive case, which is l.rest is here because we're looking at this l. And now, again, we have l1, l2, and l is this, so l.rest crack1 would be this to the empty. Finally, l is link.empty, so we're going to return two empty linked lists. And so the L1, L2 in the previous frame are going to be assigned to link.mt respectively. And at this L, we will return link of L.first and L2. So we're going to have a link. L.first is 2. And it's going to be at L. It's going to be referencing to L2. And we're going to return this. So L1 is going to be the first value of the tuple, which is this link. And L2 will be the second value of the tuple, which is L1. So again, we're back up at this L. We create a new link. L.first. L.first is 1. And the rest value is L2. We turn this upwards to this L. So L1 is going to be referencing to this new link list. And L2 is going to be L1 here because it's going to be assigned to the second value. 
Finally, we have Q and we have R. So we're going to create another linked list where the first value is L. Dot first is zero. It's going to be referencing to L2. And R is going to be this L1. So now let's trace through this on the final solution. Ooh, Q is going to be this value here. So let's trace through this here. We have Q pointing to a new linked list with 0 as the first value. The rest is going to be looking at L2. It's going to look at L1. And it's going to look at a new link. So we're going to create a new link. The rest is going to be this. And finally, its rest value is going to be L2 here, which is nil. And we have link.empty. Next, we have R. R is, let's follow the links to L1. L1 is this new link list. So we have 1 here. Its rest value is pointing to L2, which is pointing to L1, which is pointing to nil. So there we go. We have Q is um, gets reference to a new linked list with two elements of 0 and 2, and R is going to be referencing to a linked list with only one element, which is 1. Let's continue on to part D. Again, we have a recursive function call, but now we're going to set L.rest equals L2. So initially, our L is going to be at P. We have L1 and L2 like before. We're gonna, because L is not empty, we're going to keep going into L.rest. Again, L is not empty, so we'll make a recursive call to L.rest, which is this. Our new L is this. So we have L1, L2, and we have L is referencing to nil. So finally, L is link.empty. So we return two link.empty objects and assign and assign L1, L2 in the previous frame to them. So after this, we're back at L of this L. Here, L.rest is going to be assigned to L2. And then we return L and L1. So the L1 in the, our frame above that will be referencing to this L here. L2 will be pointing at L1. Again, L.rest has arrow moved to L2, and we return L and L1. So L1 again here, and L2 is going to be pointing at L1. And similarly, L1, I mean L.rest will be referencing to L2, and we have Q and we have R. So Q is going to be pointing at the head of the linked list, and R is going to be pointing at L1. So now let's trace through this. So Q is pointing at this link object 0. We have not created any new link objects, so we will not be using any of these boxes. So 0's rest was pointing at L2, which is going to be L1, which is going to point to this 2. So our rest pointer gets changed, and we have a new one to the 2 here. It's 2 is going to point at L2, which is empty, so we don't have to change this. So now let's move on to R. R arrow is L1, which is pointing to the beginning of this linked list. So R is going to be pointing at the 1 here. Its rest is going to be gets changed to L, this L2, which is looking at this L1, which is pointing to empty. So we move the rest. It's no longer pointing to the linked list of 2. It is pointing to an empty linked list. Before we do the time complexity, I'm going to go over what big theta and big O means. So big theta is what we call a type bound, in that our runtime for a certain function can not be anything that is less than linear. right? So f of n means that it has to be linear, whereas big O is an upper bound. So even if f is of n is theta of n, we can also describe it using big, an upper bounded by n. It, can, it is also upper bounded by n squared and so on. So in, a, in A, this is true because any function that is t uh, bounded by theta, big theta, it must also be upper bounded by big O. 
Next, we have this. Remember that in time complexity, we get rid of constants, and we get rid of lower order terms. So in essence, theta of x squared plus 1,000. Theta of 2x squared plus 1,000x is equal to theta of x squared. So this is true because they contain the same set. Now we look at C. I just uh, since we're getting rid of lower lower order terms and constants, this must be true, and therefore C is incorrect. Now let's move on to D. So in D, one over n gross is this. This is a function for one over n. So as we approach infinity, our time actually goes downwards. So since we're upper bounding this by one, then upper, any function that's upper bounded by something that's smaller than constant time is also upper bounded by constant time. But on the other hand, if you switch to big theta, this is not true because any function that runs in one over n time does not run in constant time. So our solution is A, B, and D. So looking at this function, we, have, we, we start off as n, so our li starts off as 0, and our uj starts off as n minus 1. Within the loop, we, all these operations are constant time, and if we enter either the first case or the second case, we're going to, so in the first case, we're going to increment li by 1, so this could be go 0, 1, 2, all the way until we reach n, or we could decrement uj by 1, so we can go n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, and continue until we reach 0. So in e uh, if we reach the first case or the second case, we will be moving right in one of, those sequence of these sequences. So the worst case is that we could move all the way from 0, 1, 2, all the way to n minus 1, and then move u of j from n minus 1 until we reach 1. So this is a total of n minus 1 plus n minus 2, two operations, which goes n, 2n, minus 3. And finally, in the next iteration, either we reach n or we reach 0. So that will give us 2n minus 2 iterations, and we will exit the while loop and return. So since we have 2n minus 2 iterations, and each iteration takes constant time, our runtime is 2n minus 2. We get rid of lower order terms and constants. And finally, our runtime is theta of n. Now for count, we have list, which is a linked list. And we have nums, which is a Python list. So we're going to iterate until our current pointer, which starts at the beginning of our this linked list until it reaches link.empty. So the total number of elements, linked list elements we have is m. We have m linked list elements. We want to iterate this one until we reach the end. So we have a total of m iterations. We have m iterations. Now for each iteration, the first condition we check is if cur.first in nums. Since nums is a Python list, a list operation n is going to iterate over an entire list, which means n will take theta of n time. So we have m iterations, so first iteration 2, 3, all the way to m. Each one of these is going to take theta of n time. So our final runtime for this question would be theta of n times m. Notice that all these other operations are constant time. Let's move on to D. In this problem, we want to look at the order of growth and the number of times that dot molt gets called. So again, we have a loop. So we want to know 
how many iterations and the n amount of dot molt in each iteration. So we see that with the uh, we have either k is odd or k is even. If k is odd, then we call molt twice. If k is even, we call molt once. In either case, they're both constant number of times that we're calling molt. So we want to know how many iterations it takes for k until we reach 0. Notice that in each iteration, we're going to reduce k by a half. So k started at 8, we're going to reduce it to 4, and then 2, and then finally uh, 0. Well, actually, that's going to be 1. And then we floor div 1 again to get 0. So since at every step we're reducing half of k, in the next iteration, we're going to reduce half of half of the original k we have. So our graph, so let's say this is n, and this is theta of f, f of n. This is a linear time graph, and this is a log k, log, log n. So in this case, we're going to reduce half, half, half. And since at this point, we're reducing half of our previous value, which is half of our previous input again, it's going to be log. So before I do double one on a linked list, I'm going to explain what a non-destructive and destructive means. So a linked list is destructive if I were to change the first element of a linked list. So if I have 3, 4, 1, it is destructive if I were to take this and change it into a 2 or another value. It, it is non-destructive if I were to move this pointer to dot rest. So L equals L dot rest is not necessarily destructive because we're only moving a pointer to the next element. So we want to double our linked list in a non-destructive way. Non-destructive also mean that, that we should maintain our input linked list as is. So we cannot insert any linked list L objects in here either. So the first thing we're going to look at is that we have a condition while L is not link.empty, which means that if it is, we're going to immediately return result. So given an empty linked list, doubling empty linked list should be an empty linked list. So result is going to start off as link dot empty. So now if we uh, this is a false case, we're going to return an empty linked list, which is fine. So result is initially starting of an empty linked list. We also set last equals none, which means that in our, f we will enter this case, we will always enter this case, if we're trying to double the first element. All right, so let's say we're trying to double 3. Last is equal to none. So what, what do we want to do here? We want to, since we're doing a non-destructive function, we want to create two linked lists with both having the value of 3, and result is going to be pointing to this. So result equals link of l dot first. That is how we get 3, and another link of L dot first. And since this is empty by default, we can just not give it a rest value. Now, how, so given that we have doubled the first element, we want to start, we want to double it in here. So we want to insert our next linked list at the end of our last element. So this is where the last value comes to play. We're going to make last pointing to the link object that is at the end of our result, which is our running linked list. So last equals result dot rest. 
So when we're trying to double the second element, put 4 and 4 here, we can use last.rest because we have access to this reference and, and make it point it to our new link objects. And by default, this is none. So in order to do this, last equals, uh, we want to change last.rest equals link of l dot first link of l dot first and since we have uh, created two more elements we want to move last to be referencing to this to our current last element so last equals last dot rest which is here dot rest but now you're asking, why can I use L dot first in either case? That's because after I move uh, double three, I'm going to move L over to four. After double this, I'm going to move it to the next one until we reach empty. So in either case, L must be moved down the linked list and assign it to L dot rest. Now we're going to um, write our double function destructively. So there are two ways to uh, write destructive linked list function. The first one is to change the mutated value. But in this case, we don't want to mutate our values. So we want to change our input linked list like this. This is also destructive because we're not create our input linked list is going to be modified. So in order to do this destructively, I want to insert a new link of three between three and four a new link of 4 between 4 and 1, and a new link of 1 between 1 and nil, empty. So we notice that we're going to have L is in our while loop. To make sure that we don't have a, an infinite link list, we're going to traverse using L. And we're going to return result. So result is should be pointing to the head of our um, input link list, so that when we, after we modify it, we can return result, which will then have 3, 3, 4, 4, and then 1, and 1. The result should be at the head, which is L right now. So now we want to insert 3. And we're going to change 3, this dot rest, L dot rest, and insert 3 in here. So the way to do this is we're going to modify L dot rest, and we're going to have it set to a new link that is L dot first, and the rest value is going to be the L dot rest that we had originally. So we're going to use L dot rest here. Remember that we evaluate the right hand side first. So we're going to create this new link list. And then we're going to modify L dot rest. Now L needs to be moved all the way to 4 here. That's, uh, we're going to do this by modifying L dot rest dot rest because our linked list now has an extra link element in here and this ooh, actually l is going to get assigned to l dot rest dot rest as we have this new extra element so l dot rest dot rest is here and then we have l pointing to 4 and then that's going to keep going. L is here. We're going to, in the next iteration, we create this. And then we're going to move L over to 1, create this, move it to link.empty. And then we exit our iteration and return result, which is 3, 3, 4, 4, 1, 1, doubling up our linked list. So in question 5, we're going to implement a special type of a tree. It's called a min heap. And it has a special property in that every node has to be has has to be the has to be smaller than everything all child nodes it has. So two is the smallest of all the child nodes it has. Four is a subtree, which means uh, also has a heap property. It's smaller than everything in all the child nodes. And same goes with twenty, which is smaller than all the child nodes. And obviously, if you have thirty, it has no children, so the meat the heap property is maintained. So this allows us to remove the smallest element by 
taking the element away, right? So we're gonna wanna return this label, we're gonna remove this leaf, and then we're gonna swap it with the leftmost element, and we're gonna use reheapify to maintain our heap structure. So this is gonna be in 4a, this is 4b, and this is what we wanna do to maintain our heap property. So let's look at 4a. We want to remove leaf. So what's it going to do is that you want, to, in order to remove the, lab, um, the leaf, we want to swap it with the leftmost, we want to swap it with the leftmost value. So children, the child, is always going to be the leftmost child. So now, here in this case, we have an if and an else. So remember that this is gonna this needs to be a recursive function because we're dealing with trees. So our first case should usually check if this is a leaf. Child dot is leaf. Because if it's not a leaf, we can immediately know that we cannot remove anything at this level, and we want to make the recursive call down to ch my child. Right? I want to remove leaf from here onwards until we get to a leftmost value. So now, if child is so, once we so in this case we are at our leftmost ooh, most leaf. Leaf is going to be child.label, and now our children should no longer consider this one that we're trying to remove. So since children is a list, we can slice it and get rid of the first element, and we return value v. So let's move on to reheapify. So after, re uh, after removing leaf, we're going to have this tree, but we had to use reheapify to maintain our heap structure. So what we want to do is, out of all of, so starting at h, out of all of its children, we're going to find the smallest one, in this case it's 4, and compare it with the root. So 4 is less than 90, so we want to swap the label, right? So we're going to swap 4, 90, so we're gonna, uh, now 90 is going to be here. So after we swap, it does not necessarily mean that the heap structure is maintained, in um, our subtree. So we should call reheapify. We have to reheapify this again. So um, here we have our, the final function, reheapify. We want we only assume that it is initial that our heap structure is violated, if at all, only at the root. So we don't care about parent, we don't want to check its cho our cho uh, each of the children. What we want to do is, we want to see if h is a leaf, because if we are at a leaf, then there has no children. Without children, we don't. The heap property is by default maintained because no value, no child node can be smaller than my label. So we just return. So in this case, where we don't, um, where we have children, we want to first find the smallest label in my children. So I start off of S is my subtree, my leftmost subtree, and I want to iterate for C and C the children. Since since S since both S and C's are subtrees, we want to compare S dot label with C dot label. And we want to update s only if s dot label is greater than c dot label. So s is going to be my smallest subtree, smallest labeled, smallest label subtree. So after we have finished finding um, the smallest label, the subtree of the smallest label. We then want to compare my, 
this subtree label and my root label. If the subtree label is smaller, then I want to do the swap. And here we can swap in one line by having s.label equals h.label and h.label equals s.label. And finally, after we have swapped, we still have to maintain the heap property in our subtree. So we want to call reheapify on the sub on the subtree that we swap we just swap with. And we're going to do that recursively, and it's going to go down until we hit the leaf. So here we have what would Python print, and it's done with object-oriented programming. In discussion, I taught my students that we should write down each class and each instance, but on a midterm, you're probably constrained on time. So I'm doing a more simplified version, and it's only gonna, I'm only going to be tracking instances. And also, I may not be able to pronounce all these Greek names. All right, so let's start. We see that we have a class person, a learner class, and a beginner class. So person is our super class. Our learner inherits from person going up, and then our beginner inherits beginner inherits from a learner. So the first things first is we're gonna do Odysseus equals learner. So we have Odysseus as our instance. It's a learner instance. I'm gonna look at it's. Um, we're gonna go to the learner class. Does it have an in it? It does, and all it does is set self dot facts to be a empty dictionary. So let's write this here. Now the next line is we're gonna learn. Learn exists because um, in the learner class, so we're going to run this function. Questions pass as God and answers Athena. And we're going to put a key value pair into self.facts where the question, which is God, is the key, and Athena is the value. And finally, we're going to return got it. So we're going to output here, got it. And we're, since we're returning a string, String, it's a it's got it in a string. So next is going to be hip. Hip is an instance of a the beginner class. Um, it's going to take in. So we're going to go to in it. The name that's passing is hypothesis. The next line is learner dot in it in itself. So we're going to call this in it, and we're going to create self dot facts and initialize it as an empty dictionary. And next, we're going to do self.setName of name. So we see that this is a function call. So we're going to look for set name in here. It does not exist, so we're going to go to the learner class. It's not here either, so we're going to go to the person, which is the um, learner super parent class, and we're going to see set name exists in here. And what it does is it's going to set self.name equals new name. So self, let's pass in is hip dot name and the new name that's passed in is name which is hypothesis so next we're gonna do a hip dot learn passing favorite person and lysis or leases I'm gonna say lysis so here we have learn learn does not exist so we're gonna go to the learner class it exists here and we're gonna put um, favorite person as the key, and the value is Lysis. So self, in this case, is hip. So we're going to have favorite person, and its value is Lysis. Now next, um, we're going to return got it. So here, again, we're returning a string. And next, we're going to do Odysseus.getName. So Odysseus is an instance of learner. It does not have the getName method. So we're going to go to person. Person does. And just all this is return self.name. And self.name. So we're going to look at the Odysseus instance first. There's no self.name, which means we're going to go to its class. Odysseus is an instance of learner. So we're going to go find the class attribute learner in the learner class. 
but the class attribute does not exist in the learner class either. So we're going to go by inheritance and go to the super class, which is Aldis. So we're going to return Aldis. So next, we're going to do hip.getName. Hip is an instance of beginner, does not have get name. It goes to learner, does not have get name either. It goes to finding a person. I'm going to return self.name. Self is hip, so we're going to find self.name here, and we see it. And we'll return as hip. Paul the list. All right, so next we have person.name equals Nemo. Reminds me of finding Nemo, so I'm going to pronounce it like that way. So person is a class. Person.name, we change the class attribute, which is this. Now it's going to be Nemo. So again, we do hip.getName. Get name does not exist in the beginner class or the learner class. It's here. We return self.name. We're going to find self.name. Does it exist in the hip instance? It does. And we return hippophilus. <coughs> Odysseus.getName. Again, there's no self.name in Odysseus instance. We look at the class attribute learner. Does not exist here. We're going to go to the class attribute at person. Here, the class attribute is changed to Nemo, so we're going to return Nemo. Now, Odysseus.setName of Odysseus.getName. So Odysseus has no setName instance because it's the learner class instance, and now we're going to go to setName here. The new name that is passed in is Odysseus.getName. So remember, this is actually Nemo because of this up here. We have not changed anything. And so we're going to um, set self.name of Odysseus. So self.name, and this is going to be Nemo. Now we're going to change the class attribute person.name to nobody. Nobody. And we're going to do Odysseus get name. So learner class, no get name. We go to here, return self.name. Now there is an instance attribute self.name for Odysseus, which is Nemo. Finally, we, next we have someone equals person. So someone is a person instance. We have, there's no init fun, uh, method for person, so we do nothing, we just initialize it. And now we're going to learn earth mass as this. So dot learn, it has no dot learn in method in here. So we're going to have an error. Now we have someone dot response of earth mass, which is the question. So question is the earth mass. So v equals self dot conjugate of the question. Conjugate is um, exists in this method. It returns none. So v is none. And in this case, we return re I do not know. Now we have hip dot response of favorite person. Response is an instance in the beginner class, and the question is this. So we're gonna call person dot response of self dot question. So we're gonna come back to here. And we call self dot conjugate question and set it to v. So self is hip dot conjugate. We're gonna look at the beginner class first, which does not exist, but it's a subclass of learner. So we're gonna have we're gonna look at here and we call this conjugate method. And we're gonna ask is this question in self dot facts? Since it is, we're gonna return self dot facts of question. So v we're gonna have v is gonna be Lysis, because that's the value of our dictionary. That's the value in the dictionary where key is favorite person. And now we see v is not none, so we're just going to return v. So now r then equals Lysis. And then we're going to return I think plus r. So we have I think and R in this case is in Lysis. Now finally, we have Odysseus.response of God. Response is in a learner instance. 
there's um, a disease in a learner instance. This has no response method, so we go to the person. We do self.conjugate this question. So again, self is a disease, conjugate is this method. We return question, God exists in my dictionary, self.facts, and we want to return Athena out. So V equals Athena, and since V is not known, we're just going to return Athena. So let's move on to the LRU cache, which is our last question, or evicted. Here we have an A. We want to find the runtime of the slow data class. Okay, item. All right, so we see that we have a ring for I in range. So we're going to do, we're going to have 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way until n. And we want to call it result plus equals mem of index i. So since mem is an instance of the slow data class, this means that we're going to call get item. We're going to call this. So in here, we're going to iterate over self.data. And if we see a match, we're just going to return the value. So in the worst case, this mem is going to run in time because we, the data could match on the last element of, the key could match with the last element of data. So in the worst case, for each of these iterations, result plus equals mem, sorry, result plus equals mem could all, in the worst case, run in theta of n time. Since we have n of these, our answer is n squared. So now let's move on to implementing the cell LRU cache, which is a fast way to access data. So in it, we see that we have some capacity, we have a slow data instance, and we have a cache. So our cache, self.cache, contains a, is a list, contains key value pairs. And what we want is that we want to check this cache for the key that we want. If the key matches, we, just, we can just return the pair, right? So if the key in the cache is um, accessed, we just return its value without, without looking at slow data. If it's not, then we're going to want to go to slow data here, right? So not in cache. So here is in cache, right? So since our cache contains key value pairs, the key in each in, uh, at each index is going to be pair of 0 equals equals key, right? So pair is the element in the cache. The first zeroth element of the pair is a key, and here is the value, which is the first element of the pair. So if there's a match, we want to, first we know that we want to return the value here. But the other thing is, if a, each value, each time the value is referenced, we want to place it or at, to the end of our cache list. So let's say this value is reference. We want to move this to the end. In order to do this, we need to remove this element and then append it to the end here. So there are different ways to remove. We can do pop. So I can do self dot cache.pop at the index. I can do delete of self, delete the cache element here, or I can do self dot cache remove of my pair. Remove takes the element rather than index. And after I removed it, I want to append it to the end. So I'm going to use a pen. And remember, I want to always return a key value pair and not i or i or pair of 0 or pair of 1. So now here is if there's a cache miss. So we know that if it's cache miss, we have to access slow data to find our value. But we want to put this into our cache. And each time the value is referenced, we put it at the end. So our cache should append, uh, append 
something. Since our cache takes in, contains key value pairs, we need to have the key to have a tuple with the key and the value. So we're gonna oh, it's actually just gonna be v because that's um, the value from slow data. And now, once we've appended on, if the length of the cache is too big, we have to remove something. Right, so it's longer than capacity, then the first item in the list is removed. So again, we want to do delete, and we just want to delete self dot cache. We want to remove the first item, which is zero. So now let's move on to part C. Before uh, that, I want to point out some um, thing about runtime. So in this loop, we're going to loop through self, the length of self.cache. But remember that our self.cache cannot be longer than our capacity. And since capacity is fixed, this will always take the time in relation to capacity, which is constant. Because this is constant, this is constant, and we have iteration, the number of iteration will always be less than or equal to capacity. And now here, when we access slow data with given key, this is going to take the theta of n time, as mentioned in part a. So now in part c, we're going to iterate i from 0 to n minus 1, and we're going to call cache man um, i each time. So i, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to n minus 1. So in the worst case, what's going to happen is that none of these, none of these keys are going to match anything that's in the cache, which means that this is going to go in slow data, theta of n. This is going to access, access slow data, theta of n, theta of n, theta of n. And any, none, no key afterwards would have the same key that's in our cache ever. So all of these would be theta of n. So since we have n iterations overall, that's n iterations overall, each one takes theta of n time, this is n squared. So let's move on to the final part of this midterm. We are at this um, d. The same code is similar, except for the fact that our index is always going to be at i in mod 4. So we're going to iterate from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way into n minus 1. i in mod 4 is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, actually. Sorry, 0, 1, 2 mod 4 is 2, 3 mod 4 is 3, 4 more mod 4 is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, and that's going to keep going. This means that our key that we um, use, that we pass in to get item here, the key here, will either going to be 0, 1, 2, or 3. Which means that after the first four indices, where there is no key match, so in the first case, 0 is never in the cache before, that's going to go slow data, theta of n. Neither will be the first time we put 1, 2, or 3 into the, as the key. But starting from this 0 onwards, it's going to see that 0 has, is in our cache, and we're going to call, uh, loop through it and return the value. Since we said that this is um, constant time because it's at most the length of capacity, this, everything after it, will always be in constant time because we'll never access, we will never be accessing slow data ever again. It's always going to be in the cache, and anytime we go into our self.cache, it's going to be constant time. This runtime will give us 4n plus n minus 5. Right, so it's 4n for the first four 
this becomes 4n, the first four values we um, access, that each one of those four takes linear time, so that's 4n. For everything after that, all the n minus 5 items after 3, i equals 3, each one of them is going to hit, um, is going to find a match in the cache as a key, and therefore we can just, it's only going to be constant time. So this is going to be simplified to n. And so the answer is 8.